And good evening to you. This is our study. This is part 11, believe it or not, of a study we began back in May of 2022, studying through the resurrection text. To keep it short, what we're titling this is a contextual study of the hope of Israel uh, or the resurrection of the dead. And again, this is part 11. We're going to be moving in tonight uh, into Isaiah chapter 24 uh, to further mark out Namely, what we are, what has been our concern in this study, is what is the death? Uh, how does the death of Adam, the death in the garden that we read about in the very beginning, how does that influence the rest of what we're reading? And then also, what how does the rest of what we're reading in the prophetic literature help us better understand what was going on in the Garden of Eden? So hopefully, that's been uh, you know something you've seen. Uh, you know, our question obviously would be what is the death and what is the hope or what is the resurrection and. Uh, I know I've been blessed by this study, um, you know, and I've been blessed by the Blue Point Bible Church. We have a study going through this very same thing. Uh, we've been doing it at a bit slower of a pace, actually about four years now. We began back in the book of Jonah, and we've been studying through the prophetic literature, asking ourselves, what is the hope of Israel? And uh, this is important. If I might wet your senses tonight before I introduce myself and lead us in prayer, this is important because uh, myself, Dr. Don K. Preston, uh, Will, Dr. William Bell, many teachers and debaters of the view of full preterism have often said that the out from the dust resurrection, again, what we read about in the Garden of Eden, right? The dust, you will return to the dust. The out of the dust resurrection is, finds its basis in Isaiah chapters 24 through 28, Isaiah chapter 52, Hosea chapter 13, and Ezekiel chapter 37. And what this out from the dust resurrection that's demonstrated in these texts is, is the hope of Israel. And again, uh, what we've been endeavoring toward is finding out, well, what is that? And I hope that you've, uh, you've seen that already. And I believe tonight will just further magnify uh, that understanding that we've gained as we've journeyed through the, the biblical literature. I'm going to give us a review here in a moment. Uh, however, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Mike Miano. I'm the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church, and uh, I'm the apologist of MGW Apologetics. That's Miano Gone Wild Apologetics, where the goal is to encourage the Christians, the church, the saints of God to have a zeal empowered by knowledge, rather than what we often see, and the, the Bible laments, the Apostle Paul particularly, a zeal without knowledge. Most people running this race where they're saying they love Jesus, they love God, they praise God, they praise Jesus, they hope to die and go to heaven, yet they know nothing about these things, or they hope not to go to hell for that matter, and they know nothing about these things and are actually being encouraged, which should bother us as uh, those that know the truth, uh, are being encouraged to maintain those presuppositions, and others are doing that by offering up false Bible teachings and other issues. So uh, again, large part of my ministry is helping the saints do the work for themselves, see these details in scripture, and be blessed by them, and prayerfully bless others. So uh, that being said, uh, this is our study. I'm going to go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer, and then we will jump right into a review, and then a study of our text tonight. And I do look forward to a time of discussion, maybe Q&A, uh, or again, simply comments and, and so forth, what we're seeing as we're studying through these things uh, from those of you that are here with me in the Zoom session by call-in. And if you're watching on social media, please uh, consider writing your, your comments in the comment box, and that way you can be a participant in our study. All the Zoom information, all the call information is all over the internet at this point, so I hope that you've gotten your hands on that and uh, are able to join with us uh, for these studies when you so desire. So that being said, let's go ahead and uh, pray to the Lord, uh, ask him to lead our study, praise him for what we've already come to know, and trust him for the increase. Mighty God, we do thank you. We thank you for all the beautiful ways, Lord, all the beautiful attributes you have become known to us. Uh, we think of the many titles that we can find in scripture, Lord, uh, to lift up praise to you this evening. Uh, many of them corporate realities that we've experienced in you, but also, Lord, those intimate, personal, individual realities that we've come to know as well. So, Lord, go before us tonight. Enliven us with understanding. Bless us, Lord, with joy as we come to understand all that you have provided, all that we have in you, Lord, uh, as we look at this story, this sad story of death and sin and uh, the need and the hope for resurrection, Lord. We thank you because we know you, the resurrection, and we ask that you go before us tonight, again, enliven our understanding so that we would uh, truly know the hope of our calling, that we would truly be able to defend and teach these things to others so that we might have a truly God-glorifying understanding emanating from your church. 
go before us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, again, I'm very excited to kind of jump into our evening tonight. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to go ahead and share this to the best of my ability on social media. And that way, we can have others joining with us for this rather important topic. Again, Dr. Don K. Preston, many of you know him from the Preterist Research Institute. He's labored intensely in debates and teachings and books in showing you why Isaiah chapters 24 through 28, what we often call or scholars refer to as the little apocalypse texts. And uh, he's labored to show you that these texts are pointing to the very resurrection hope of Israel. So uh, again, I stand upon the shoulders of giants in these regards and uh, look forward to blessing you and being blessed myself in these things. So let's do a quick review. We started in Genesis, Genesis chapters two through three to be a bit particular. And what we noted there was the story of Adam being placed in the Garden of Eden, imagery that we see in the prophets, which we will see as we move a bit further, uh, talking about the presence of God. The land of Canaan is referred to as, uh, well, when Israel is in uh, good relations with God, when they're endeavoring to at least walk worthy uh, or try their best to walk worthy, they, um, they, they basically, excuse me, sorry, I lost my train of thought. They, uh, they glorify God. They try to uh, walk worthy of their understanding. They live in the Garden of Eden in the land of Canaan. Again, that prophetic language. So my, my, uh, my point would be that with Genesis chapters two through three, we see this beautiful placing of life uh, into life uh, with a Garden of Eden. They have uh, the, where the, the tree of life is able to be accessed. Whether they accessed it or not is a discussion outside the purview of our study. Um, however, we know that Adam and Eve are eventually barred from the tree of life, removed from the Garden of Eden. So uh, we noticed that, and the reason being, they sinned. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thus heaping upon themselves the punishment. What was the punishment? That they would die that day. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we know they did. And then not only did they die that day, but then they hid from the Lord. And then when the Lord appeared, he pronounced curses upon them. And also, of course, covered them with animal skins, all of which we have noticed points to the Old Covenant. You have um, the curses that were manifest through the law of Moses. Uh, if you disobey, these curses will be brought upon you. We've seen that expanded a bit in Deuteronomy chapters 28 uh, through 31. And uh, all throughout the law of Moses, we see death. This is something else we talked about. The death being magnified is this sort of removal from the very presence of God removal of God's favor upon you, uh, where nations will now come upon you and you, you will no longer eat the fruit of the vine that you had planted in the land of Canaan, in the garden of Eden, so to speak, when you were in favor with God. So hopefully you saw the correlations as we moved from Genesis into the law of Moses. And we asked ourselves a particular question. The question was, what death is the law of Moses magnifying? Now we know when you read through the law of Moses, there's plenty of reference to physical death. When you stone somebody to death, what death is that speaking about? Of course, physical death. Uh, when somebody was, when someone was to be put to death for whatever sin that they had committed, uh, that we know was physical death. However, what did that physical death represent? What is truly being magnified through those details? And again, we know, even ancient Israel knew, that represented separation from God. They ultimately understood going to Sheol uh, as separation from God, a time where you would have no life, no opportunity for redemption, no opportunity to walk worthy of the blessings of God. Uh, and thus you would have to wait for the time of judgment. And uh, so again, we've seen this imagery, this in the law of Moses, uh, magnifying the law, uh, magnifying the death that we highlighted, Adam died that day. So hopefully you've been tracking along and we called it uh, relationship death or covenant death or fellowship death uh, rather than physical death when we had studied through those details. I guess it's important to let you know real quick, uh, as a matter of review, you can go to mianogonewild.wordpress.com, which is my personal blog site. I've been putting these video links as well as the outlines for these studies up on that site. And any, any uh, resources that I might mention in our study tonight will be provided in the outline and have been provided in the outlines each week. So that being said, um, we also moved further from the law of Moses, we moved into the wisdom literature. Wisdom literature obviously includes Job, includes Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. And we asked ourselves again, where do we see pictures of resurrection? We went to some of the more important or highlighted texts 
Job chapter 19. We also looked at Psalm 110, I believe it was, uh, quite a few different Psalms that are used to depict resurrection. And uh, we noted again, the wisdom literature highlighting this sort of uh, di divine disfavor or disfellowship. You know, Job, his friends wanted him to think that the reason why he was going through bad things was because God was angry with him. And we know that Job stuck to his gun, so to speak, and defended the fact that no, God gives and God takes away. Trial comes to those that are even righteous and, uh, you know, that are walking worthy of the things of God. And Job stuck to his guns and, and said that he would see God in his flesh. And many have sought to uh, say that that's talking about some future resurrection where we, we will be raised up in our bodies. I think that we did a great job showing otherwise. And um, so then we moved, finally, we've moved into the prophetic texts, which again, uh, we know are very important to this study uh, that, you know, we often see this prophetic language being used in the New Testament and it's important and it, it's, incumbent upon us that we would, uh, you know, study through these things and get a good handle on them. And um, I just recently listened to a debate between, we mentioned Dr. Preston before, and Joe McDermott. And in that debate, Joe McDermott actually argued against the effort of going back to the Old Testament and gaining the understanding that the first century Jews would have been steeped in, uh, gaining the understanding of these things to better understand how they're being fulfilled in the New Testament. That should trouble us because we know the Apostle Paul, for example, explains in Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 26, that he preached nothing other than that which was revealed, in, that which was written in the law of Moses and the prophets. So it's incumbent upon us. Again, it's, it's, it's important. It's, it should compel us to study the law and the prophets and to better understand these things. And being that Paul was speaking oftentimes and Jesus himself in prophetic language, that's why I believe the prophetic language prophets themselves are so important for us to study so we began with Hosea which as I already previously admitted was sort of an error on my part I had wanted us to start with Jonah Jonah being the earliest prophetic text that we might find in the, the 18 or the 800s BC and uh, that would be what the um, 9th 8th century BC there or 8th 7th whatever <laughs> um, the numbers don't matter again you know it's 800 BC a uh, time where the Assyrians the uh, Ninevites, the uh, what's the language that's used in um, in uh, the book of Jonah? Was it Nineveh? Uh, I'm forgetting. Uh, is that where Jonah was supposed to go to? I believe so. Um, and if so, again, that's Assyria. So Assyria was the sort of world power in the time of the 800s. And Israel, again, was supposed to have influence, as we know from the law of Moses, upon the nations. If they walked worthy of the things of God, what would happen? They would, you know, uh, they would overcome these nations. They would, you know, they, they would have their, they would be the mighty kingdom of God. They would overcome these nations by prayerfully causing those nations to look to God. We see that in the book of Deuteronomy. So, um, and they wouldn't have to fear these world powers overtaking them. However, if they were disobedient, those world powers would overtake them and would be a problem to them, would be a thorn in their side, so to speak. So when you enter in on the book of Jonah, now catch the power of this, Jonah is told to go to Nineveh. Again, it's a picture of ancient Israel. Go to Nineveh and get these Ninevites to repent, to realize the things of God. Jonah doesn't want to do that. Jonah wants to hoard this, this wealth that he has, this relationship with God, and decides to flee the very presence of God that he's been blessed with and go to Tarshish. Obviously, that story leads him into a picture of death. But tell me, does this not sound like Israel's story? Uh, you, you know, Then he gets placed into this a fish for three days and three nights. We talked about how obviously Jesus uses that imagery to talk about his resurrection. And he calls, Jonah refers to this as hell uh, in his, his language there. And then he is ultimately by a work of God. Again, that's what I believe that three-day imagery is talking about there, a miracle, if you will, uh, a work of God. Jonah is spit out of the fish and then go, walks worthy of his call. Is that not, not what we read in scripture of what God has done for his people? Again, it is Tuesday. I love to call Tuesday a testimony Tuesday. Let us just realize that that story is a story of old covenant Israel not walking worthy, hoarding the wealth, walking away from the very presence that they had been blessed with. And then by a miracle, by a working of God, God caused his people to walk worthy. The church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known. We read that in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter three. So um, again, just so important to really become familiar with these, this language and what's really happening here. So in Jonah, we saw a lot of great imagery and a lot of great detail there about resurrection. And then 
Prior to that, we had studied, but again, if, if we're going chronologically, the next portion we would go to would be Hosea. And Hosea, we know, was prophesying to the northern tribes. He's given this imagery of a, a prostitute, to marry a prostitute and divorce her, and uh, to use that to demonstrate God's relationship with the northern tribes. And as we know, uh, God walked worthy in faithfulness that if they walked in disobedience, he would cause the nations, the world powers around them to overtake them. Sure enough, 722 BC, the Assyrians come in and take over the northern tribes. And uh, again, much of what you're reading in Hosea is judgment upon the northern tribes. And the promise, as you read in Hosea chapters 13 and 14, uh, you read about this promise of restoration, this promise that he will restore them. And we know Jesus, what did he say? I come for none other than the lost tribes of the house of Israel. So again, we saw that in the book of Hosea. We marked out that uh, Hosea brings our attention back to Adam. If you remember, like Adam, they have violated the covenant, talking about, again, the northern tribes of Israel. So what that does is it gives us an interesting thing here. It helps us understand the, uh, that Israel is attached to Adam, but then it also helps us understand what Adam did wrong. He violated the covenant. So for those of you that have you know, a good handle on covenant creation, there's your reason why it's called that title. Because what we're saying is that, is that in the book of Genesis, there's a covenant that Adam violated and experienced death, covenant death, fellowship death from God, very akin, if not akin to the, the story of Israel, where Israel, the death that they manifested was because they sinned. What sin? They went into idolatry. They blasphemed the very name of God. God said that they would become a byword. We're going to see that in the prophetic literature, that they will become a byword to the nations and to God and to themselves because of their disobedience. And we saw that magnified through Hosea. And then also, of course, this promise of restoration. And we saw that in Hosea chapter six, as well as Hosea chapter 13. Hosea 13 is important because we know, as is going to be the case with the texts we're moving into now in Isaiah, this is what the apostle Paul refers his readers back to when he talks about the resurrection of the dead in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So, you know, many of us are familiar with the hoop, all the hoopla and debates around 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, what we should be doing rather than, you know, sticking our feet in the ground, I, I think that's the way that phrase is, goes, you know, sticking our feet in the sand, so to speak, and saying, this is where I'm going to stand. We should be going back to the prophetic literature and opening up the understanding. You know, the Jews were steeped in these things. They didn't have to go back and think about Isaiah 24. This was their worldview. So, you know, when these things were spoken, the Jews around the people would know, and then they would obviously tell the people. Have you ever been around, a, I think of like a, a concert. Have you ever gone to a concert where maybe you knew some of the author, some of the singers that were there, and uh, you were excited to go, and then all of a sudden a singer came on stage or a band or whatever it might be, and you're not familiar with them? And then all of a sudden you turn to your friends, you say, who's that? And your friends know. That's, again, picture the preaching in the first century. Picture if you had heard about this man named Jesus, you came to stand in front of whatever apostles were preaching at that time. And then they began to use such prophetic language that was found in the Old Testament. Imagine the Jews that were standing there. They would have been able to inform the Gentiles that were right there. Oh, this is what that means. You know, this is what he's saying. The Gentiles may not have understood, but then there would have been excitement from, you know, just as much I brought up that concert, I have friends that, you know, they wouldn't even wait for you to ask who, who these people are. They're going to tell you. They're so excited. And the Jews would have been so excited to know that Jesus is proclaiming to be the very fulfillment of our prophetic hope. So it's important for us to understand the prophetic hope that you just go without saying. Don't let anybody try to remove your mind from that and tell you, you know, uh, you know, I, I heard in the debate I mentioned before with Joel McDermott, Joel McDermott actually had the, you know, the sense to say, Don wants you to constantly bring all the context from these Old Testament texts into the New Testament. Yes, that is exactly what Dr. Preston wants you to do, because that's exactly what was being done. Don, actually, I'm going to share some links on the, uh, the outline for this video uh, from Don on Isaiah chapter 24, and he explains this a bit. He explains the hermeneutic of using the Old Testament to better understand the New Testament. I'll let him go ahead and share that with you. Uh, he talks about this concept called metalepsis. That's something you're going to want to take note of. That's, uh, you know, using a familiar phrase in a new context. But again, the phrase would bring people back to the, the context, the original context. Metalepsis is the phrase, uh, the word. And then also, I have a book I'm looking to read very soon uh, that Don actually recommended. It's been sitting on my shelf for years. It's called um, Echoes of 
uh, it's echoes of Old Testament in Pauline literature or something to that effect by a man named Richard Hayes. And uh, I know that's a resource I'm going to be leaning in on. So if you're really listening to this and you're saying, I need to really study this out and prove this, those are some resources that I'm already going to be mentioning, providing. Dr. Preston provides them for you. So dive in. So hopefully I've given a good review at this point. I think it's time for us to jump in on this text and uh, see what Isaiah has to say. Uh, we're going to look at, again, the little apocalypse beginning here in Isaiah chapter 24. And I want to let you know real quickly before we enter in on the reading. Apocalypse. Contrary to popular thought, apocalypse does not mean confusing, mysterious, veiled. It actually means unveiled, clarifying. So when we read about an apocalypse, the goal of the apocalypse is not to leave the people in confusion. Usually the reason why the apocalypse is happening in scripture, at least, is because the people are already in confusion. You're going to actually see that in our reading tonight. So the people are in confusion, and then this apocalypse, this event, whatever the apocalypse is, most of us think of devastation and destruction and war, which is correct, uh, in this case at least, is going to reveal what God is doing. And hopefully you'll see that tonight. I believe this is a great snapshot of God's purpose for his people uh, that we're going to read here. So we've prayed. Let's go ahead and enter in on our reading. Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. And the people will be like the priest, and the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower, the creditor like the debtor. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers, the world fades and withers, and the exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed the laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and a few men are left. The new wine mourns, the vines decay, all the merry-hearted sigh. The gaiety of the tambourine ceases. The noise of revelers stops. The gaiety of the harp cease. They do not drink wine with song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of chaos is broken down. Every house is shut up so that no one may enter it. There is an outcry in the streets concerning the wine. All joy turns to gloom. The gaiety of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city, and the gate is battered to ruins. For thus it will be in the midst of the earth along the peoples, among the peoples, excuse me, as the shaking of an olive tree, as the gleaning when the harvest, grape harvest is over. They raise their voices, they shout for joy. They rejoice and cry from the West concerning the majesty of the Lord. Therefore, the glorify the Lord in the East, the name of the Lord, the God of Israel in the coastlands of the sea. From the ends of the earth, we hear songs, glory to the righteous one. But I say, woe to me, woe to me, at last for me, the treacherous deal treacherously and the treacherous deal very treacherously. Terror and pit and snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees the report of disaster will fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare. For the window above is opened and the foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken asunder. The earth is split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth reels and to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a shack, for its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on the earth, and they will be gathered together like prisoners in a dungeon and will be confined in prison, and after many days they will be punished. Then the moon will become abashed and the sun will be ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be there before his elders. Wow. So I'm excited to jump in on this. Now, again, what I do want to encourage you to do is after this video, if you're listening to this, go ahead and visit the, well, not right after because it's not going to be uploaded, but in a couple of days, make sure you go to the outline that I mentioned on my blog site and visit the three videos that I share, the three links by Dr. Preston, that he leans in on this text. Because again, I stand upon the shoulders of giants 
in these things. Uh, again, uh, also here reading on my own, I also stand upon uh, the spirit of God illuminating the text. And uh, another great insight I have is the Blue Point Bible Church, because we've done this study here at the Blue Point Bible Church. So I got some notes to share that we've talked about in a collective fashion. Let's go ahead and just take a look at some of the things here in this text. The first thing I have to mark out for you, the word earth. Don't be confused here. The word earth does not mean planet. The word earth is the Hebrew word aretz. Many of you know I often talk about this. In the book of Genesis, we read that Abraham left his aretz to go to another aretz. Nobody interprets that to mean Abraham left the world to go to another world, unless you maybe mean the you know the concept of that men, the ment mentality of that world, you know where Abraham was living. Nobody believes he left the planet and went to another planet. It's the same Hebrew word used here in Isaiah 24, aretz. So right away, that should change your understanding. Behold, the Lord lays the land waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. It surely changes things when you, you stop reading it as if it's talking about the planet Earth and it's talking about the land. Some might bring up, though, let's go ahead and look at this, where it says the world. If you notice there, uh, what verse was that in my text? I'm reading out of the NASB, NASB by the way. Um, the earth mourns. Okay, verse four. Let's take a look at verse four here. The earth mourns and withers. So again, I'm telling you, Aretz, earth, does not mean, you know, uh, world or planet. It means land. So let's read it correctly. The land mourns and withers. The world fades and withers. The exalted of the people of the earth of the land fade away. Now, world is contingent upon. We know this because we talk about, uh, matter of fact, I'll bring up a personal insight here. When I was in prison, uh, we often used to say, when I get in the world, what did we mean? We didn't mean when we leave this planet. We meant when we get out of the world that we were living in and we get into another world. We use this in a contemporary fashion in that same way. You know, oh, well, that's the world they're living in. What world are you living in? We use these phrases. So we understand world doesn't necessarily mean planet. And I want to tell you here that the world is contingent upon the land. It's the people that are living in the land. They're the people of the world. They're the focus here of this text. And if you've been journeying with me, uh, as I know the two of you that are here, Edward and Vicki, you've been joining with me uh, in Isaiah already. And you know that Isaiah starts out to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah. This whole book, while it includes prophecies about other nations, is primarily pointing to the people of God. A lot of times when I read Isaiah 19, for example, and it talks about the destruction coming upon Egypt, what we should find ourselves doing is lamenting for Egypt because if Israel only could have walked worthy of their purpose, Egypt wouldn't have had to be destroyed. Egypt could have been saved. That's the contrast between the old and the new. That uh, unfortunately in the old, there was this picture of since the people of God could not and would not manifest truth, the nations died. The nations suffered. Whereas now we know thanks God to thank God for Jesus Christ, we know the nations glorify God. And as we see there in the beautiful imagery of Revelation, the nations bring their glory into God's glory. And we get to see nations redeemed for the glory of God. And we know that this doesn't happen on a global scale as, uh, you know, I think we'd be hard pressed to mark out a nation uh, sometimes uh, in this world that really is walking worthy of the things of God. And I, I hate to say that as, a, again, a citizen here of the United States that I think does a great job, but I don't know that we would call the United States the church. The church does a perfect job of bringing forth the will of God. And uh, again, so without getting uh, led away, I want to just go ahead and take note here that the land mourns and withers. Why does the land mourn and wither? We're going to find out here in a moment. If I may, actually, let me back us up to verse one. So we talked about the land. The people will be like the priest, the servant like her master. I'm not going to read through the whole verse. What's going on there? Everybody will be made alike. You know, when hard times come upon a nation, what happens? The rich and the poor are pretty much at the same, on the same line waiting for the same food. You know, there's no more caste structure. So that's what's happening here. There's going to come a time of suffering upon the land where both people are going to be leveled out. And, you know, the rich are going to be like the poor. The mistress is going to be like the, you know, the maid is going to be like the mistress, etc. cetera. Uh, then you go in, the land will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled for the Lord has spoken this word. 
The land mourns and withers. The world fades and withers. The exalted of the people of the earth fade away. Again, that should be something in my Bible. I'm going to underline that. The exalted of the people. Uh, again, you don't have to go too far in the law of Moses or in prophetic literature to realize that Israel at this time was the exalted people. They were the people that God had set on high, that he had given them his purposes, and he wants them to become a nation that you know the people stream to them to learn from him. So notice, continuing in the text, the land is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. There's your cross-reference already to the things we've been reading. We know Adam. We just talked about this, Genesis 2 through 3. Adam violated a covenant. All through the book, law of Moses, it's highlighting the covenant that God had with Israel. Then you get into um, the book of Hosea. Like Adam, they have violated the covenant, talking about the northern tribes. Again, now here, Isaiah is prophesying after, what, 200 years after Hosea, and saying to the southern tribes, who should have learned from the judgment that happened to the northern tribes, now he's saying to the southern tribes, you've broken the everlasting covenant. All the people at this point, everybody, the, the whole nation of Israel has broken the covenant. That's what's going on here. Therefore, a curse devours the land. And those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the land are burned and few men are left. Again, you see the imagery? Again, we, we know two things about Isaiah. He was prophesying in real time to the looming destruction of the Babylonians. But then he was also prophesying, as we know the Apostle Paul quotes from him, toward the future resurrection, the eschatological resurrection. Or let's call it this. He was prophesying toward Jesus. He was prophesying toward the resurrection, which again, Jesus is the resurrection that brings forth the resurrection of the dead. So we see Isaiah prophesying in his time, yes, talking about the, the looming judgment of you know, God that's going to happen at the hands of the Babylonians, which did in 586 BC. And he's demonstrating this is his judgment against them. But we're also going to see this language used by the apostles. And if you're a Christian, we believe the apostles. We believe that's the true interpretation of these things. So that's why we see the apostles drawing from the law and the prophets. Uh, continuing here, so they're going to be burned up. Now, the new wine mourns. I'm not going to read through all that language. I think we get it. It's, it's you know, miserable. <laughs> you know, that, that's what's going on there. Verse 10 is particular, obviously, something we want to talk about. The city of chaos is broken down. So, you know, I thought about this earlier. I said, if this was a planet and the whole planet is a problem, why would we be talking about a city? What city? That would be important. However, when it's a land and you ask about the city, it's a bit more important. And we know here the city of chaos that is broken down due to the people of God not walking worthy of the promises is who? Jerusalem with the temple where the covenant stood. That's what's going on here. Desolation is left in the city is verse 12. That should remind us of a text we're going to have to look at here in a moment. Matthew 24. What did Matthew 24 say to the, uh, what did Jesus say about that judgment that would happen at the end of the age? It would be for the fulfillment of what? The abomination of desolation. He talked about that in Matthew 24. And you're going to see something interesting with this text and Matthew 24 here in a moment. So desolation is left in the city. Notice verse 13. For thus it will be in the midst of the land among the peoples as the shaking of an olive tree as the gleaning when the harvest, grape harvest is over. So this destruction, this desolation that's going to come upon this city is going to manifest. It's going to be, again, catch the imagery here. When you shake a tree, you know, you shake the tree, the olive tree, what happens? The olives fall down for you. I actually had the privilege uh, and the burden, if you will, uh, of picking olives in Israel uh, during the November, excuse me, the November season. And it was hot and it was tedious to get up there and pull down every little olive and you have to kind of rope yourself around the tree to pull down the olives. Now imagine the easy effort. It's the proper time of harvest. The Lord has put this harvest time upon us. Let's shake the tree. And all of a sudden, you know, everything would fall down. That's what's happening here. The destruction of this city is going to be the shaking of an olive tree. It's going to be as the gleanings when the grape harvest is over. Some would argue, if I may offer up another view of this, by the way, that this would be uh, talking about there will be nothing. It'll be complete devastation. However, I, I read it a bit different, and I think there's room for the, the disagreement in that regard. Let's continue in verses 14 and 16, which again 
This is where you see the reversal. Okay, so this whole devastation is happening. And this is why I said what I just did about verse 13. I believe verse 13 is sort of reversing the mentality here. So everything is desolate, confused, destroyed. And then all of a sudden, this tree is shooken. If I can use that phrase, the, the, the tree gets shaped shaked well however we're going to word that uh, however what happens next now let's look at verses 14 through 16 they raise their voices they shout for joy they cry out from the west concerning the majesty of the lord therefore glorify the lord in the east the name of the lord the god of israel in the coastlands of the sea from the ends of the land we hear songs glorify glory to the righteous one well that's far different than what was being manifest in the last 24 chapters of the book of Isaiah, the people are not walking worthy. The people are not glorifying the Lord. That's the hope, that there will come a day where they will glorify the Lord. And we know the glory has been revealed to us, Jesus. It's only because of Jesus that we can glorify God. This is a prophecy toward Jesus, the need for Jesus. But at last I say, woe to me. They dealt treacherously, treacherously, treacherously with me. I believe this is a personal note here from Isaiah, because Isaiah is the one that has to unfortunately deliver this prophecy to his generation. And as many of you may know, the prophets were all killed uh, in the city of Jerusalem, killed by the people. I, I believe the story of Isaiah is that he was sawed in half. I believe he's one of the, uh, the historical martyrs that they say were sawed in half. So that being said, um, you see here, he's saying, I'm, I'm prophesying this word of God to you that God will receive glory through his people. And you're persecuting me because you know it's because of your misdeeds, because you violated the covenant. These things are going to happen to you, not only in Babylon, not only from the Babylonian invasion, but also we know later on at the hands of the Romans. And interestingly enough, the, uh, the historian Josephus says that we knew that this was God's judgment upon us. Why? Because he knew this language. He knew the language when Jesus said it to that generation. Josephus, if you know, he would have been young, he would have been around, he knew what was going on. The people knew what Jesus was saying to that generation, whether they decided to trust God or walk in their own understanding. That's unfortunately what was left to that generation. Continuing here, verse 17, terror, pit, and snare confront you. Pit is going to be interesting. We read in, um, we read in Jonah, Jonah called the belly of the fish, what? Hell, Sheol. Here you have terror and pit. And I believe that if you were to do the digging, this probably is Sheol. Some translations may even say Sheol. I'm going to look. I have an NIV Bible here. I want to go ahead and see. 2417, uh, terror, pit, and snare await you. Um, I'd be interested to see what, what text might be there. Uh, however, again, this is a picture of death. Terror, death, and snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. And it basically demonstrates that no matter what this person does, their, heavy, their transgression is so heavy upon them, or these people do for that matter, uh, their sin is so heavy upon them that they will not escape this judgment. Notice verse 20. For its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. Now verse 21. So it will happen in that day. In the day of what? In the day that this desolation, this destruction is brought upon the people as to manifest the glory of God. It will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the hosts of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. And they will be gathered together like prisoners in a dungeon and will be confined. After many days, they will be punished. Again, when I read that, I have a hard time not thinking about the Roman Jewish war of the first century. Uh, however, again, this happened with Babylon in the, uh, the Babylonian invasion as well. Uh, I, I just think it's interesting correlation there to uh, what happened in the first century. Uh, what did they do? They all, you know, the Lord gathered, and we see this language, by the way, in the book of Revelation. Revelation talks about the kings of the earth. Remember the, uh, the land beast and the sea beast? Uh, here you have a land beast and you have a heaven, uh, you know, or you have a land, kings of the earth, uh, to use the language appropriately, and the host of heaven. To do a study on the host of heaven, I'm not going to get too, too much into that tonight. I would make a case that that's Israel. They're the people set on high. It's sort of like uh, as the church, and I believe it's Ephesians chapter two, it says, or even Ephesians one, you have been set in heavenly places, speaking to the church as their current reality. It means to be the people that are in favor with God. It means to be the people that are being used by God. And here we know old covenant Israel was, again, that was the goal of the law for them to walk worthy and cause the nations around them 
to look to God. So here, I would think, I would think it's, again, you can do this study on your own and it'll reveal itself. The host of heaven is talking about Israel. The kings of the earth are going to be these world powers, Assyria, Babylon, uh, you know, uh, Greece, Rome, the, the zealots, which become a, a world power in the land uh, during the Roman Jewish war. Um, they're all going to be gathered together. And they were, they were gathered together in the city of Jerusalem, the city of confusion, city of chaos that was being broken down as per verse 10. They were gathered together like prisoners in a dungeon. And then as we know, that war took about three and a half years and then they were punished. There was, you know, the, the, Israel was led away in, in captivity. And as many of you know, I often teach that that was the beginning of the end for Rome. So uh, then of importance, and this will be sort of where I'll conclude my thoughts for this evening, um, of importance would be this very last verse, verse 23. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. Now, I want to take you on a bit of a historical chronology here real quick. If you're an Israelite, a Judite, a person living in Judah, of the house of Judah, in this, what, 6th century BC, and you heard this prophecy, you'd know that this was speaking, you know, let's say you lived during the time of the Babylonian invasion. You'd know that this spoke to that moment. This is, man, Isaiah told us this was going to happen. And this happened. However, notice nestled in here is this picture of the Lord reigning, right? Verse 23, we just read. The Lord reigning, his glory being exalted. We read that in verse 23, as well as verses 14 through 16. That again, it's not just a judgment, but that there's a glory that's going to follow. Now, if you're living in the time of Isaiah and you hear this prophecy, the Babylonians come upon them. They go into captivity for 70 years. Jeremiah builds upon that prophecy as well. They go into captivity for 70 years. They get out. They go about restoring the temple. The Ark of the Covenant is not there. They go about restoring the uh, temple in a manner that they have to keep their sword in their sheath. Uh, you know, they have to keep, or no, I'm sorry, they have to keep their sword unsheathed, excuse me, uh, where they have to be ready for battle at every moment. Hardly sounds like the favor of God with these people as they're building this temple. Hardly sounds like the case that Solomon had early in the days when he built his temple. You know, so again, here, these people are trying to restore the temple and are having to fight to do it. The Ark of the Covenant is not there. The glory of the Lord is not being demonstrated through these people. And then there's no prophet sent to Israel for hundreds of years. And the confusion is just heaped upon them. They get more and more confused, confused more so than the time prior to the Babylonian captivity. And again, their, their, their sin becomes exasperated to the effect that when Jesus comes on the scene, 500 years after the last prophet was sent to Israel, comes on the scene telling them, by your traditions, you haven't validated the word of God. You can't even hear the things that I'm saying. You can't even see. If I was to put the promise in front of you, which I am, as Jesus said many times, you wouldn't be able to see it. Notice how blinded they had become. Now, again, my point is, is if you were a person living in that time, you would have known well, the judgment, Isaiah said, happened to us, but the hope, the promise, the glory that the Lord would receive is not here. Where is it? And generation after generation after generation would wait for it up until the time, unfortunately, as we know, the religious leaders began to find their own ways of explaining how this would manifest, what would be the hope of Israel. And by their teachings, they very they invalidated the very resurrection that was being promised to them. So that's why it's so important. Again, I think it's so important, and I believe hopefully we've already explained this again and again, why it's so important to go back to the Old Testament and look at these prophecies to get a better handle on what's going on. So what's the death? The death is the sin. It's that they've broken the covenant. They're being cast away from God. What's the promise? That they'll be restored. A glory, the glory of God will come out of his people. He will be faithful in causing that to happen. And they hope for it and hope for it up until the time of Jesus. Now imagine this. You're living in the days of Jesus and Jesus says, I am the resurrection. And then he goes about using this very language. For the moon will be abashed and the sun will be ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Je Jerusalem and his glory will go before his elders. And he tells that generation, you're going to see this. You're going to be alive to see this. I'll show you right now. He did do that, by the way. Let's go ahead and look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. 
Notice this. Well, let's start verse verse one, of course, uh, chapter 24, verse one. I just want to give you some context. And Jesus came out of the temple. Now, mind you, chapter 23 is important. Chapter 23, Jesus declares destruction and desolation upon Jerusalem and its leaders. He's leaving the temple at this point. He's going out from the te temple. His disciples came up to him, pointed to the temple buildings. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another, which will not be torn down. Again, there's no way that you would have been a Jew that wasn't familiar with what happened during the Babylonian captivity where they destroyed the temple. But Jesus even goes to say that not one stone will be left upon another. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What things? The things he just said in Matthew 23 and the destruction of the temple. And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Now, if you're journeying with me this far in Isaiah, hopefully you're familiar with the fact that Isaiah uses coming of the Lord language constantly to talk about war. So the disciples here are already informed of these things. They already are familiar with Isaiah. They know the language. They're asking him, when will this war be? When will this time of devastation upon this city of confusion be? We know the language of Isaiah 24. And then Jesus goes on to tell them the signs. He calls also that, you know, tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? It's important to note that they qualify that this destruction of the temple, this coming of the Lord, this moment that Jesus is speaking about is going to be the end of the age, the end of the present evil age and the bringing in of the glorious, the glorious, notice that, age to come where God would receive his due glory. Now, if you don't mind, jump, jump with me over to verse 29. Now, if you want to know about the tribulation, you read verses 15 through 28. It talks about the desolation of, of ab abomination, again, prophesied by Daniel. Daniel prophesied against that, that generation as well and against Jerusalem. But notice verse 29, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky. Notice the way, oh, well, let me back up, let me read it. Stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We already qualified what that language is, right? We know that in Isaiah 24, the host of heaven is talking about the people. We already qualified that. We already qualified that this language is talking about the Babylonian invasion upon Isaiah, upon his generation. So what is Jesus doing? He's bringing their minds back to Isaiah 24. Remember the city of confusion there? Remember the people that have violated the covenant? All up until this point, Jesus has been telling them, you violated the covenant. Again, read Matthew 23. It's hard to miss. And then he uses this very same language. The stars will fall from the sky. I, I find it interesting that this says stars will fall from the sky. Reason being, if you go to Daniel's prophecy, again, interesting way that this is all woven together. In Daniel chapter 12, the people, when they're resurrected, if you remember what happens, they shine as the stars in the sky. That's the point. Stars are used as representation of the people of God. All throughout the scripture, Abraham, your children will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. It's language that's constantly used to refer to the people of God. So notice the power of what's going on here. Bring your minds back to Isaiah 24, the city of destruction. I'm telling you, Jerusalem, right now, this is going to be that time for you. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken going into verse 30. And then the sign of the son of man will appear in the sky. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels to, with a great trumpet, and catch this, and they will gather together his elect from four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Why are they gathering together? They're, notice there's two different gatherings happening here. There's a gathering in the earthly city where people are being confused and then led to desolation. And then there's a gathering of a people that are being resurrected and that are obviously being saved. So there's two pictures of gathering happening. In Isaiah 24, you saw the gathering, the city of confusion that would be gathered. Jesus is bringing his readers' minds back to this very text, Isaiah 24. So it's so important to understand what's going on in Isaiah 24. If I might show you some other references, um, Hebrews chapter 12. If I may read the very first verse, very similar to what I just did with chapter 20 of Matthew 24, uh, Hebrews 12, we're going to look at particularly verse 22, but notice this, therefore, many of us are familiar with Hebrews 11, talks about the saints of the, uh, you know, those are the greats of the faith, so to speak, 
Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. Okay, so notice the context. Now let's go over to verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels. The reason I'm saying that to you is if you remember in verse 23 of Isaiah 24, the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. So now keep your thoughts there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion. Those who know Jesus, those whose author and finisher of their faith is Jesus, have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now flip back over to Isaiah 24, verse 23. Notice the fulfillment. Jesus said, use this language to talk about the time of desolation that would come upon Jerusalem. And then he speaks about the sign of the Son of Man that would be revealed, the gathering of his saints. To what effect? For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. So you see this happening right here in Matthew chapter 24. Matt, Jesus is bringing his readers' minds back to the picture that's being painted in Isaiah 24. I ask you folks, as uh, well, I often ask our adult Sunday school, where do you see that you're going to die and go to heaven and get a new body in any of this? Where is that being revealed? That that's the hope that we're talking about. That when Jesus restores his people, they're going to get a new body and live in heaven and sing songs all day. Is that what you're getting out of this? That's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a God saying, this is a city of confusion. I'm going to create a city of my people who are going to show my glory. And I'm going to do that through what? His Messiah, through Jesus. Again, and we're seeing the New Testament writers believe that. Let's take one more look at one more text. Revelation chapter 21. Again, and hopefully I'm also giving you a sort of correlation here of, um, what is it? Uh, Matthew 24, Hebrews chapter 12, and now Revelation chapter 21. And in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, now, again, we know, let, let's just go ahead and start, start at 21, verse 1. Uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Uh, I do think there's an interesting correlation here. If you remember in Isaiah 24, uh, I thought it was interesting that it says, in the coast, the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, in the coastlands of the sea. Because, again, we know the sea often represents the Gentiles. So here in Revelation 20, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, in Isaiah 24, the Lord would be glorified among the Gentiles when the promise is complete. Here we find, obviously we know in Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. So there's no more sea. The sea has been completely removed. And then, of course, go to verse 20, what verses did I say? 23. And the city, so there you go. We're looking for a restored city. So here it is. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon going to be important here i'll explain to shine upon it for the glory of god has illumined it and its lamp is the lamb in the old testament we know that israel relied upon the sun and the moon for their different feasts for their days for light during the day and light during the night again for quite a few different reasons a lot of very ceremonial covenantal things they relied upon the sun and the moon so when they came under judgment and the language was used, then the moon will be abashed and the sun will be ashamed. It was that they would no longer be able to walk worthy of their covenant. You don't want to walk worthy of it? Well, then I will take it away from you. I'll remove it. Now, notice this. In the restored covenant, they don't have need for the sun and the moon. Why? Because the very promise that they were hoping for in Isaiah 24, that the glory of the Lord would be found in them, is now found in them. It's Jesus. You know, again, just see the, you know, actually, if I may, back up to verse 22. And I saw no temple in it. For the Lord, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun and moon to shine upon it, for the glory of the Lord has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nation shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. 
hopefully you're seeing the covenant details that are being said here. Uh, right there, you know, they depended upon the sun and the moon. That's why Jesus used such language. That the sun and the moon are going to be darkened. Your system is going to be completely laid desolate. And in the new reality, this system will not matter. And again, I don't know that I need to go into all the uh, depths of helping you see that the first century religious leaders did not understand it. They did not see it. They did not have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And that's why they crucified the Lord of glory. They had a wisdom of that age, not the wisdom that comes by true spiritual discernment. One more text I'll bring up in chapter 22, verse 5 of Revelation. And there shall no longer be any night, and they shall not have the need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God shall illumine them, and they shall reign forever and ever. Go back to Isaiah 23. What was the goal? For the reign of the Lord. The Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. I get to tell you tonight that this is a fulfilled good news. Uh, you're actually going to notice as we move into the rest of this chapter, everything that we read in Matthew 24 correlates to this. This is what Jesus was bringing his people's mind to. There's nothing about this future judgment of all the people on the planet and going to heaven and God destroying the earth. Again, hopefully you catch the imagery tonight. Jesus is bringing his readers' minds back to his listeners' minds, back to Isaiah chapter 24. And also the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, is bringing your mind back to Isaiah chapter 24. Also, Revelation chapters 21 through 22 are bringing your minds back to Isaiah chapter 24. So such an important text to get a handle on. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your mics. If you want to jump in and share some thoughts, I definitely encourage you to do so. Yes, I would like to share some thoughts on uh, Isaiah 24. Let me get there. Isaiah 24, verse... Uh, <clears throat> I believe it's verse five, uh, where it talks about the earth is also defiled by its inhabitants for, mm -hmm. because for they violated laws, uh, altered statutes and broke the everlasting covenant. Now that's, that's probably where they're talking about. I believe you have referred to uh, the same uh, uh, breaking of covenant as Adam. Mm -hmm. So, and then Jesus coming to uh, save the lost tribes of Israel, I believe when, when the resurrection had occurred, I believe, you know, when came time for judgment, I believe Adam was included in this. Um, that's, that's just from my perspective. Um, uh, uh, I had wanted to share what I had learned from your whole, your teaching basically that I was unaware of as far as, um, it'll come back to me. It'll come back to me when I go to that, to the revelation, which you have spoke on in revelation. About the sun and the moon and the shining of the oh, light. Oh yes, the sun and the moon. Oh my goodness. I didn't like, I've heard the sun and the moon being equated with their feast days. And um, being that their feast days were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. <laughs> they were all eating and talking about uh, Jesus Christ and being Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. You know, there's no more need for the, uh, the feast and the feast days because Jesus is the fulfillment, mm -hmm. you know? So therefore, you know, no need for this, the, the sun to shine and the moon to give its light because Jesus is the illumination, Jesus and God. So therefore, you know, I, I see it so much clearer, you know, in that regard. And that's that's a vital piece of information because people when they when they talk about the sun and moon, you know, confusion sets in or they come with all these various ideas, you Absolutely. know. But yes, it's wonderful. Yeah, if you remember a couple of years ago, uh, what was it? John Hagee, I believe he came out with the book uh, Blood Moon Rising or something to that effect of blood moons, you know, and that confused folks yeah. because they think, you know, we're talking about the actual moon and, and, and things like that, where they failed to understand the prophetic imagery being uh, associated yes. with. Such and, and I think, you know, the stars falling from the sky, that could be also the, um, the falling away and then, you know, being uh, uh, resurrected in truth through Jesus Christ. I don't I don't know how to equate that, 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of room for that language. If you study through the language of the stars falling from the sky and things like that, the heavenly host, um, mm -hmm. to see it relating to the people of God. It's yes. Relating to people that are in disfavor with God if you're falling from the sky, so to speak. Yes, yes. And when you talk about the heavenlies and, and stars, you know, in the sky, you're talking about God's people in, 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 in their glory and, and, That's right. And God's favor. Yeah, amen. If I may, uh, I know we're not there yet and we're going to get there, but I want to just go ahead and share with you the prophecy from Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 12. A matter of fact, there's another one as I'm flipping through my Bible. In Micah, Micah actually mentions uh, that you will, his people will shine like the jewels in a crown. I, I love that one. Uh, however, let me go ahead and bring our attention over to Daniel chapter 12. I'm over here flipping. You know, if you're there, Edward, if I could ask you to read Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Okay. And those who have insight uh, will shine like the glow of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. There you have it. Well, I hope you folks are doing something and leading people to Jesus. I hope that, you know, you're allowing God to use you. And if you, so you're a star in heaven, you're the fulfillment of this very verse shining with insight, uh, you know, highlighting again, the, the, the picture of righteousness so that others would uh, be led to the source of righteousness. So that you stop, you shine, excuse me, like the stars in the sky. So, you know, that's the fulfillment of that promise. It's Jesus. Now, hopefully you're seeing this is saturated with messianic promise. Uh, all within this. Yes. Is it Colossians um, Colossians 1 27 where it talks about uh, the mystery being Christ in you, the hope of glory? Yeah, it's, I think it's Colossians 1 27, I believe is 1 27. But I think that it's the text. Yes. The reason why I wanted to say that is because when we, when we shine our light and be that star, you know, that's Christ shining through us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not in and of ourselves with uh, words of enticement or however, you know, to lead people. It's Christ shining through us. That's right. That's right. Living crucified lives. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Colossians 1 27, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, hopefully you're seeing it tonight. Are you seeing the glory, the hope of glory? That was the hope, that God would be glorified through his people. How is God glorified through his people? Beautiful reference, Edward. Uh, Colossians 1.27, Christ in us. That's it. I mean, again, I, I'm now I'm overly excited. See what you did, Edward? Um, you know, but again, that, that's, that's the reality. Uh, you know, these texts are demonstrating this for us. That's apostolic wisdom. So, you know, I would encourage us to have this mentality of God wanted glory from his people. You know, you ever read, uh, they have these famous catechisms, right? Like the Lutheran church has a catechism that they, they read. And in most of them, the very first question they ask is what is God's purpose for man? And they'll all say almost, you know, repeatedly to glorify God. So if God's purpose from the very beginning was to have his people glorify him, what did we see with Adam? They didn't listen. They walked in disobedience that did not glorify him. What did we see with Israel? What did we see with Jesus? The opposite. And then if we find our righteousness in him, we're running against the very death that was manifest in the old covenant. And the only reason we have that is because Jesus fulfilled everything he said he would, including the fulfillment of Isaiah chapters 24 through 28 include which we're going to see uh, is going to be a resurrection text. The apostle Paul is going to use Isaiah 25, which we're going to get in on uh, to demonstrate the hope of resurrection. And I believe we've already done a good job of laying the groundwork to see again, I, Isaiah 24 is a beginning of a prophecy. You might even say 23, uh, a mm -hmm. beginning of a prophecy that's going to complete in 28. So when we get that full picture, we'll see, Oh, that's how the Lord was going to get his glory. And then how does that help us understand why the Apostle Paul uses that to make his case for the resurrection of the dead in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's what we're really after here. So uh, if you don't mind, 
uh, I guess uh, Vicky might be busy, so I wanted to go ahead and open up. If you have any questions, Vicky, please uh, unmute, ask us, or make any comments that you'd like to make. Uh, Edward, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share some thoughts. I did a, a little bit of random digging today on social media, and I found a, a gentleman that's not friends with me, uh, but he had posted just today his thoughts on Isaiah chapter 24. He actually posted on Isaiah 24 through 26, but I'm going to save the rest for uh, our time going through uh, this study. We're going to call him Danny uh, because I don't want to give out his full name, but I want to read to you what he wrote, and then I want to ask you, and we could have some conversation around how we would help him better understand uh, what, what's going on here. In keeping with the theme of judgment seen in chapters 20 through 23, the message of God's judgment upon the earth is presented in Isaiah 24. However, this judgment is a judgment upon the earth instead of one nation. The chapter opens with the declaration that the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. Verses two through three list the various groups of people who will be impacted by these judgments. Simply stated, every class of people will be impacted by these judgments. This judgment comes because the earth is defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Verses four through five. Isaiah 24 verses seven through 13 describes the anguish of people upon whom this judgment comes. Isaiah 24, 19 tells us the earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. Its transgression is heavily upon it. However, there will be a time of restoration. Then the moon will be disgraced, the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. So, Edward, I'm curious, what did you think of what this gentleman wrote and uh, what might you bring up to create a conversation with him? Okay, what I would bring up, I have the King James Version, you know, because I like how Don had used uh, King James. In verse 1, where it talks about, behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. And we understand that as the rest, you know, the, uh, the land, okay, and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down. Now, if you were to take it literally, now, how does that sound, you know, uh, turn it upside down? But anyway, mm -hmm. and scattereth up abroad the inhabitants thereof. Now, when inhabitants are uh, um, um, scattered, that's, that's um, being like taken out of their land. Um, and once they're taken out of their land, that's like um, alienation from God. That's like being separated from God. And that's a form of death. You know, so you could also go back to... Uh, um, Genesis 2 and 3, when Adam was taken out of the garden, that's that form of returning to the dust. Right. You know, use, useful, use, usefulness and stuff, uselessness and things of that nature, where he had come from, where he was planted into the garden. And he went back, you know, out, outside of the garden. Um, and then in verse 5, this is the, what I find the most important, where it says, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. So the earth was defiled by the people of God because they have transgressed the law and changed the ordinances uh, and broken the everlasting covenant. Now, <clears throat> do you think um, the earth will be destroyed because we broke, we broke in the gospel, the laws of the gospel, or you know, the whole world would be destroyed because of the breaking of the gospel? Or was the whole world uh, destroyed because they broken the oracles, rather the the everlasting covenant, the people of God? Um, that doesn't make very much sense, yeah. you know, because they're talking about the people of God in this in this in in this eighth century, whatever century it may be, and and they're talking about these specific people. So when judgment had come upon the earth, it came upon the land which the land was the land of Israel and the people and the city that was destroyed was the city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And the inhabitants of course are the people of Jerusalem. So the judgment came upon them. You know, that's what the Bible is talking about throughout the scripture is talking about Israel. You know, uh, 
Gentiles are, are to be uh, to receive the fruit that Israel supposedly are manifest through the oracles of God, but being that they failed, the nations died as far as spiritually, you know, because they had not the, the oracles of God, you know, so um, if Israel was blessed, the nations were blessed. Israel was cursed, so were the nations because this is where the light was, you know, the light of the world was, it was Israel at that time, you know, prior to Jesus, you know, the fulfillment, the hope, and things of this nature, you know. So where does he stand on the hope of Israel, this young man? That's something oh. else to inquire. That's right. Yeah, how he's going to bring this all together. You know, you know, you made some really good points. Um, I appreciate that you brought up uh basically universalizing this doesn't really make good sense, or as our brother Larry Siegel would say, make good nonsense. Um, you know, not only do we have obviously the local indicators, for example, the word arets, uh, that can mean land. Um you mentioned some good points there about turning it upside down, over literalizing the text. Uh, and then, of course, um, the inhabitants, I thought about it, I said, well, how do you scatter inhabitants of a planet? Um, the only way that that would make sense is having the illusion of uh, the Tower of Babel. You know, that's what it should be bringing the reader minds back to is the confusion. Remember, the city of chaos, the city of confusion should be bringing the people back to a Tower of Babel imagery, not some uh, total world destruction but rather a scattering of a group of people. So I thought you brought out some really good points in that regard. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, as far as this gentleman, I'm not gonna let the cat out of the bag yet. I'm, I might actually reach out to him. Like I said, I simply went to Facebook. I went into my search bar and I put in Isaiah 24. And this person's name, Brother Danny, we're gonna call him, he, uh, his name popped up and this was his, he was the most recent person in any of my Facebook realm, I guess, through friends of friends that posted about Isaiah 24 in the most recent hours. So uh, again, it might be somebody we could drum up some conversation with. Uh, so I might go ahead and comment, maybe share some of the things we've said here uh, with him and see how that might influence some things that he's going to say about Isaiah 25 and 26. Yes. Sound good? Uh, that being said, I hope that it'll do the same for us uh, as we are studying. And I mean, for us here, as well as those that are viewing online, as we continue to study through these texts next week, jumping into Isaiah 25, very important because the Apostle Paul uses this to understand resurrection. Let's stay consistent with what we've just read in Isaiah 24 and noted how it's already being used in the New Testament in texts such as Matthew 24, uh, which again, we know Matthew 24 was fulfilled in that very first century. There's things that say it right there in the text uh, that this would be fulfilled in this generation. Uh, what's that? Uh, verse 34, I believe, Matthew 24, verse 34. So we know that was fulfilled in that generation. So if this is all going to be a text that's woven together, then we're going to have to keep the consistency of what we read here in 24 with 25. And then whatever we're demanding of 25 has to find its fulfillment in that generation. That's how I've been, you know, seeing these things. So I trust you'll see it yourself. Um, yeah. any last thoughts you want to share, Edward? Just that, um, like you had mentioned, Isaiah's prophecy is the warning about the the invasion of Babylon. That's right. You know, and uh, that has to, you know, be placed in the equation in putting these things together, like this gentleman talking about the moon and the, and, and the sun and things of this nature. It's, it's not being consistent with what the actual scripture, you know, is talking about the topic and then it is talking about the people uh of, rather of judah right uh the, the southern the southern uh 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 the southern tribes so, yeah this book is particularly to the south the northern tribes no longer exist when isaiah's prophecy right, right. hosea's hosea time was the prophecy of of the pending doom with the Assyrians. right at the north right exactly yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, I want to let you know, uh, we pretty much unearthed all the notes that we shared at the Blue Point Bible Church in our study. Uh, we had thought the same things we have highlighted tonight. Uh, verse five being very significant. So, Edward, I appreciate you standing, uh, being consistent with that effort. Um, verse 23, we saw the importance of understanding that language. The moon being dismissed is what some texts say. The sun being ashamed. Um, we talked about the beautiful song of praise that we see in verse 26 there with, of course, this uh, the glory of the Lord uh, 
being our praise uh, from the people of God. And uh, lastly, we notice the continued, and you'll see this through all of our texts, the continued judgment salvation theme. God's going to bring forth a judgment, and that judgment is going to manifest salvation. Was it the Babylonian captivity? Uh, was it, you know, uh, or was it AD 70? Or for some reason, would it be something in the future? Uh, you know, uh, hopefully you're, you're with us, tracking with us, that these things happen within that generation. And they're not speaking to some sort of ethereal reality, some sort of new body that we're going to get when we die, or any of that, but rather speaking to the very restoration uh, within the people of God, what we I often refer to as the corporate body view, uh, that God was restoring his corporate people, uh, not I, but, you know, many that journey along with me in these studies, uh, you know, that God, his resurrection promise was a corporate promise to a corporate people that they would sing the glory of the Lord. And today the church, prayerfully the church you're going to or attending gathering with, uh, glorify the Lord. And uh, if I might uh, close out by encouraging you, if that's not the case, may we ask the Lord to uh, encourage you with 10,000 reasons to give him praise. I might encourage you, if you're not praising God and giving God the glory, go ahead and uh, go to YouTube, put in 10,000 reasons, Matthew Redmond, find yourself singing the praise of God tonight, ending your evening like that and saying, you know what? We are living in the goodness of God. We are living in the land of the living. And uh, we have such opportunity. If maybe, you know, I know Vicki and Edward, you've already heard that song. I'll give you guys another challenge. And, and those of you that are tuned in as well, go to uh, YouTube and put in the word surrounded, song surrounded. I'm forgetting right now off the top of my head who it's by, but put in Christian worship surrounded. And I'll tell you, the song right there, you want to talk about the power of fulfillment. Uh, that song demonstrates it all. And uh, I believe you'll, you'll see that if you take that opportunity. That being said, thank you for being here with me tonight. Let me go ahead and close us out with a closing prayer. And uh, we'll continue next week, next Tuesday night, 7.30 p.m., looking at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 25. Mighty God, we do thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to fellowship here tonight. Lord, we were uh, small in number, but again, mighty in heart, mighty in wisdom. Uh, we thank you that you have provided all things pertaining to life and godliness. I thank you, Lord, for Vicki and Edward who are here with me. Uh, I thank you for their desire and diligence to learn these things. Of course, I thank you for the many that will tune in online that are already tuning in online. And uh, we pray that you would... Uh, Continue to let us shine as the stars in the brightness of the firmament. Thank you for giving us such a reality. And uh, we just exclaim your glory, Lord. And thank you. Uh, be with us. We have many praises and prayers we continue to petition you for. And we bring them to mind this evening. And we ask that you allow us to find continued testimony, continued praise, as we see your faithfulness before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here with me tonight. God bless. Thank you. God bless.